to record Vicky Explores part two. But today I'm going to be met by some very special guests. Um, I always like having a guest <laughs> on an explore. However, I have come into Canterbury East Station and as you will know, uh, viewers, being very learned in the ways of the railway, there is a second Canterbury station and my guests are gonna be arriving there. So, which way? round to Canterbury West Station uh, I planned to have a very brief stop at Canterbury Castle I'm very sad to say that it's closed because it's falling down um, it needs a little bit of repair work uh, but the castle dates uh, way back of course to the Normans it was one of the very first castles that was built uh, at the request of William the Conqueror and it was one of the ones that formed a ring of defence around the approach to the city of London. But sadly, can't get any closer than this. I can see them, I can see them approaching. They're here, they're here. <laughs> this is Henry. Hiya. This is Molly. Hi. Former Canterbury resident. Yes. Uh, keeper of all Canterbury knowledge. <laughs> oh, you might be, you might be selling it a, a, a bit, you know, a bit highly now. I'm not sure. If that's... I don't think so. These guys know stuff. Uh, <laughs> should we go and get a cup of tea and yeah. figure out a plan? Absolutely. In the last episode, our story ended with Canterbury becoming the centre of English Christianity. Today, we're fast forwarding slightly to hear about one of the city's more gruesome stories. It's a little bit miserable, a bit rainy bit. at the moment, <laughs> but maybe this is a good setting of the scene sure. to tell this quite dark story. So uh, it is the end of the 12th century. Yeah. Sir Thomas uh, Beckett is the Archbishop of Canterbury. He's brutally murdered. Yeah. Uh, first of all, who was Sir Thomas Beckett apart from being the Archbishop of Canterbury? Yeah. So as well as being the Archbishop of Canterbury, then before that he was a very good friend. Uh, Thomas Beckett was a very good friend of King Henry II. Okay. Um, yeah, he was. Uh, he was a Chancellor and trusted advisor to Henry II, things like that. And um, Henry decided that he wanted more power and control over the church. Okay. So he decides. I know. I'll appoint my best friend Tom uh, Thomas Beckett to the role of Archbishop of Canterbury. He'll do what I tell him. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. But was that the case? What happened? Not quite, no, no, because once he gets appointed to this role, then uh, Thomas decides to actually take the job seriously. Ah. Um, and to, you know, and to appreciate the separation of church and state that it has to involve. And so, you know, Henry, you do your job, I'll do mine. Okay, so Henry is not happy about no, this. No, completely not. Um, but how does that lead to his murder? What does what does Henry do to instigate his his murder? So um, basically, um, because of you know being appointed to this role and uh, Thomas deciding not to just do what Henry tells him, they get into all sorts of arguments and things like that. Uh, eventually, the Henry is overheard saying the immortal line, "Who will rid me of this turbulent priest?" Uh, yeah. Some passing knights over here, Henry say this. Right. And you know, so they think, oh, that's an order from the boss. Off they go to Canterbury on their horses, arrive at the cathedral, and they murder him. They take matters into their own yeah. hands. Beat, uh, they beat him to a pulp, and they're, you know, and they're, uh, and they're chopping bits of it off and stuff like that. It's really quite gruesome. Uh, but and then, yeah, he, but he's, you know, he's in this sort of praying position the whole time. He takes quite a long time to fall to the ground and actually die. Okay. Um, but yeah, they uh, uh, finally, good on him. Yeah, fi <laughs> finally, blow to the head. He falls to the ground. Uh, the bells of Canterbury Cathedral ring out as he uh, as he hits the ground. Oh my goodness! And myths sort of start up. You know, is it his ghost doing this? Was it just not that it happened? 
be on the hour. Uh, well, is God ring the bells because he's angry at his servant being killed? Who knows? Okay, and that's probably the sort of reluctance to die. Yeah. Essentially, <laughs> it's perhaps one of the reasons why very quickly he he's made a saint. Mm. He seemed to be this this incredible figure that people really want to come and worship. So yeah. it starts this tradition of people pilgriming to Canterbury yeah. to see Thomas Becket's shrine yes. uh, and obviously also visit the cathedral as well. Yeah, absolutely. So they make these pilgrimages these religious journeys to the shrine uh, of St Thomas Becket in the cathedral um, and eventually then Henry II himself makes one of these pilgrimages oh. um, uh, you know, as sort of penance for the crime of, uh, you know, of the Archbishop having been murdered essentially by his hand, okay. you know, metaphorically speaking. Yeah. And so he, he walked barefoot through the streets of Canterbury and is whipped as he did so. Wow, okay. Um, this story yeah. is rather gruesome story leads us nicely into the sort of the next milestone within Canterbury's history, um, which is the Canterbury Tales. Yes. Written by Geoffrey Chaucer. Yeah. Uh, and the focus of those tales is a group of people pilgriming to Canterbury to yeah. worship at Thomas Beckett Shrine. Yes. Uh, so uh, let's go and check out some of Absolutely. those locations. We are standing outside what is now the Canterbury Tales experience, where as a visitor you can come and find out about Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Yeah. But I want to talk a little bit a moment about the tales themselves and what they did for Canterbury. So this was an epic poem. Oh, it really was. Almost a novel. Yeah. Um, which depicted a set of characters, a real mix of characters from across medieval life, making their pilgrimage to Canterbury. And it's already put Canterbury on the map as a destination to Completely, come. Completely, yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, it was yeah, you know, it became this really popular tourist destination. I mean, people were already making these sort of religious pilgrimages what? off the back of you know Thomas Beckett's murder and things like that. But this book really put things on the map. It's one of the first books written entirely in English. Most books at the time would be written in French or Latin. Uh, English was much more of a spoken language, often spoken by the working man. Uh, so this book was much more accessible to working class people as a result of the fact that it was written in English. Even though Chaucer's tales tell the story of pilgrims on their way to Canterbury, there is one location you can visit that is mentioned in the book. So Henry, this is was now Hardy's sweet shop. Yeah. But what would it have been, and what did it appear in the tales? So what this would have been back in the day is it would have been uh, the Checker of Hope Inn, which was a sort of hotel where various pilgrims would come to stay. Um, you'd have sort of the lower class, uh, but so you'd have the lower class people on the second floor, richer people on the uh, richer pilgrims on the first floor. Uh, but I think it used to be said that you could get 500 pilgrims in uh, only 100 beds, so you'd end up with like five to a bed, you know, <laughs> okay. uh, because of how poor they'd be. But um, this is particularly, it's referenced in, I think, the tale of Berin in the Canterbury Tales, which is sort of towards the end. I think it was actually intended as being the first tale for them on their journey back, but the Canterbury Tales has never officially finished. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was intended, as I say, as the, this was where the pilgrims would have stayed, where the miller, where, you know, etc. would have stayed. Though not mentioned in the tales, the Westgate Tower is also likely the gate through which many pilgrims would have entered Canterbury on their way to the cathedral. The Pilgrim's Hospital on St Peter's Street was built especially to provide shelter and food for any pilgrims visiting the city. Chaucer wasn't the only figure from literary history to be associated with Canterbury. The playwright Christopher Marlowe, a contemporary and likely friend of Shakespeare, was born in the city. He lived with his parents in his formative years at number 57 St George's Street and he was baptised at the Church of St George just a few doors down. Another story of murder and revenge associated with Canterbury is that of Sir Thomas More, Chancellor to Henry VIII. Sir Thomas More, like Thomas Becket, disagreed with his monarch. He refused to acknowledge Henry VIII as the supreme head of the Church of England. As a result, he was arrested and charged with the crime of treason. He was found guilty and beheaded in 1535 in London. Just like any traitor, his head was taken and placed upon a spike across London Bridge. But shortly afterwards, his daughter, Margaret, managed to claim back her father's head and she brought it here to Canterbury, where she had it interred in the family vault at St Dunstan's Church. 
For centuries, nobody knew of the location of Sir Thomas More's head. That is, until the 1800s, when an accident happened at St Dunstan and the lid of the family vault was knocked off, exposing the contents inside. Today, inside the church, you can find a plaque dedicated in memory to Sir Thomas More and a beautiful stained glass window which tells his story. And thus ends my second explore of Canterbury. Although we still haven't reached the 20th century yet, so uh, perhaps a third video might be in order. Until next time. Canterbury is a is a is a real cultural hub. Yeah, there's a lot of creativity, artistic stuff yeah. happening here, um, which I think we can uh, thank Chaucer for. Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Chaucer. Thank you, Chaucer. <laughs> uh, on that, I think we'll say goodbye. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, go and get warm in a pub somewhere. <laughs> uh, thanks for following. See you next time.